I want to ask you this question. Have you ever believed something that nobody else around you believed? Have you ever been in a moment where, I don't know, maybe you're a Cowboys fan and you were surrounded by Texans? It's a bad example. Um, I remember my parents, they taught me that Santa Claus wasn't real. And so when I went to school, especially in first grade, I remember telling all the kids that Santa's not real. And when I did this, you know, they were adamant against me. Like, you, you got no clue what you're talking about, Trey. And I'm like, no, Santa's not real. And so the teacher, I think her name was Miss Duty, and uh, we, 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 we asked her the question, is Santa real? And, of course, I'm expecting to get my, you know, because my parents couldn't have lied to me. And she's like, no, Santa is real. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so it would take a couple of, n- another couple of years for the kids to catch on. But the reason I say that is because I believe in the church we believed a wrong doctrine or theology that we're just going to have to struggle with sin until we get to heaven. See, I don't even get amens on that, right? So we've all believed this Santa Claus theology and we've never been allowed to mature and grow up because of our wrong belief system. And so I want to hit this head on. I want to talk to you about how the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of you gives you freedom to overcome sin. Can I get an amen from somebody today? I want to look at a passage in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. Paul is contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant. He says that uh, when Moses went up, he received the glory, which is the goodness, the presence of God upon him that caused his face to shine, and he had a veil over it. But he says there's a greater glory living on the inside of you. In 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, see even the Holy Spirit's agreeing with me right now, I guess the thunder. Verse 16, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Somebody got, praise God. Y'all in the first service today, I didn't have to stop and read that again. Praise God, thank you. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him. You ever seen that Michael Jordan? I want to be, I want to be like Jesus. As we are changed into His glorious image. Now, I want you to catch this. Because for us to walk in that freedom, there first must be a turning. You must first leave the old lifestyle, leave the sin, step into the kingdom of God. And it's more than just turning and burning. I know we preach a God, you know, some people are saying, it's turn or burn, right? No, it's turn and learn. There, there, there's this moment in Christ where you begin to grow up and grow into Him in all things. When you do that, when you begin to turn what's happening you're growing in the image of becoming like Jesus I I love that word that word turn in the scriptures the the theological term is repentance that means metanoia to change one's mind to change the way you think what what if we grew up in the wrong home what if we thought the wrong way what if our pursuits was self-seeking and it was when Jesus came and saved us He didn't save us so that we kept from going to hell one day. He saved us to put his spirit inside us and change us. Have you all ever heard that gospel? Because I don't think it gets preached enough, right? We preach a, I hear so much of Santa Claus theology. Say the prayer so that you get to heaven one day, right? But you're going to have these struggles. You're going to have this sin. You're going to have these problems. And, And the only issue with that theology is Jesus' death wasn't enough. We need our own now. Ooh, I can just feel it by the Spirit. Some of you are struggling with this. But if you catch it, if you catch the turning away and pursuing Christ, you'll have a freedom that's only given by the Spirit. In this place, you're going to what? Do not. You're going to grow. You're going to learn. You're going to be point number one. You need to be fed. You need to be fed. It's that growing in intimacy with God. Notice when Jesus, who, who says, learn of me, when he overcomes temptation, how does he do it? He's in the wilderness. The spirit leads him there. And Satan comes to him and says, uh, why don't you take that stone and turn it into bread? 
Now, this is Jesus. He could have took a mountain, made it a blueberry muffin, had a log of butter running down that. It must be noon. I'm getting hungry right now. He could have done that. But instead, he spoke the word. And see, the problem is a lot of us face temptation, but we're speaking Netflix instead of the word. Right? Well, this is what they did on Netflix. Well, we don't, we're not saying it like that, but we're filling, we're feeding on the wrong source. And because we feed on the wrong source, we don't have the power to overcome. Yeah, I'm a dad, right? What if I told my kids, hey, we're having ice cream every night? I mean, they'd love me, but they wouldn't be nourished until they got to tw like 20. And they're like, my dad was an idiot. Like, he didn't even feed us blue belly. He was so cheap, he gave us blue bunny. But there's something about being nourished in the word that allows you to overcome because you find that there's a true freedom by changing the way you think. And it's not because you don't want to burn, it's because you want to learn. My grandfather in 1957, he's going to give his heart to the Lord. In fact, he says it like this. He walked into the back of it. I mean, he was a good Baptist. He sat in the back right off the start. And come on, I don't have no Bapticostals in here like that joke. <laughs> And, but, but anyway, he hears this gospel, not, not so much a gospel about don't go to hell. He hears a gospel about a God that loves him right where he is and wants to forgive him of everything he's ever done. Now, that's like, that's, that's crazy. What? And, and he even says, I was like, I was in the midst of struggle. I, I was planning on cheating on my wife. And I, I, the Lord, by his grace and mercy, brings me to this service. And I'm like, what kind of God would want me? And he says yes to that. In the midst of him saying yes, he finds a freedom. He says, yeah, I got radically, he doesn't understand people that just barely get like, just, uh, well, I just, you know, I just do this because it's something to do on Sunday. He says, I got radically saved, right? And when you turn, when you leave the darkness that you were in and get into the marvelous light, that is the first step of enjoying the freedom that Christ provided for you. And you'll start to feed on his word and you'll, you'll be full on what he's speaking to you daily. And as you're fed, you're going to have to be dead. So when I've been in church, I've heard Romans 7 like my whole Christianity. And if you're new to it, I'm going to give you just a, a glimpse of it. Romans 7 is this. I, I do the things that I don't want to do, meaning I'm sinning and I don't want to sin. And living right for God, doing good things, like I can't, for some reason, I can't do that. And I, as I've heard Romans 7 as a church person growing up, it's like, well, that's just where we're going to be. You're going to have struggles sometimes. Just, just expect that in your Christian walk. But the only problem is it misses a lot of good theology. It misses what Jesus did on the cross. And in fact, even in Romans 7, I could take you there and he says this, it's not me sinning, but sin living in me. So it lets me know this first thing, that i got to stop identifying with sinful behavior. you got to stop saying, well, my granddaddy was an alcoholic, I'm an alcoholic, uh, or, or my dad was an alcoholic, I'm just going to be an alcoholic. Hey, my name is Trey, and I'm an alcoholic. No, not if you got saved. You may have been an alcoholic, but when you said yes, yeah, but I got saved and then I kept drinking, well, you just didn't understand what happened, right? So you, you get to this place, he says, uh, well, it's not me that's sinning, the answer, he says it in Romans 7, the answer is in Jesus Christ, and then he goes into Romans 8, and he says these powerful words that you need to catch, there is therefore now no condemnation. Maybe you, don't, maybe you don't quite catch that. Let me, let me make it more plain. Beating yourself up over your sinful past will never make you right with God. 
I just need to bootstrap it. I need you to get more discipline. I just need to try harder. I wish that would work. Maybe then I'd be pretty good at it. But it never produces righteousness. And it, what it does is it allows the sin, guilt, and shame to weigh you down to where you fell. And you're like, man, I'm always going to fail. That's just who I am. And, you're, you're, and then you read Romans 7 and some pastor comes along and says, yeah, you're gonna, we just all have issues. And you're like, that's the guy I should be listening to. And so you believe Santa Claus your whole life. You're like a senior in high school. Look, never mind, I'm going to leave that alone. But, (laughs) so he goes on after saying there's no condemnation, and he's going to say in Romans 8, verse 9, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You catch that? Uh, That's like my my son, he loves remote control cars. And uh, we got him one year, we got Grave Digger, which is like a big monster truck they had at Walmart. It was huge, like... Some of you are like, you're not saved. Great difference. Like, no. We cut the skeleton off just so we could be saved. Anyway, <laughs> but my son loves to run the remote control cars into people, like especially his three sisters, like chasing them around the house. And uh, had, hadn't done it in a while because they run out of batteries, and we do not try to get them charged. But anyway, <laughs> one of the times he was hitting me in the leg with Grave Digger. I did not look down at Grave Digger. And say, Grave Digger, what are you doing? I didn't do that. I'm like, Grave Digger, stop it, right? Because I knew my son was controlling the car. And see, if you're a sinner, you're controlled by your dopamine release in your head. You can't escape it. It's going to be what it is. But when you said yes to Jesus, the controls left those hands and went into the spirit of God's hands. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. So again, he's identifying two different groups. People that believe Jesus and people that are sinners. There's no in-between, right? And Christ lives uh, uh, within you, so even though your body will die because of sin... The Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Now, I've read this because I want to get to a therefore, and I couldn't get to the therefore until I read this. But I want you to capture what Paul is trying to say in these verses. First thing he says is that God lives in you. You know the one that said, let there be light in you, right? And he says, not only that, you've been made right with God. Now, I want you to catch that more than just right standing or or you have a legal justification. I want you to catch the implications of being right with God. He's not saying that you're 50% right and you need to earn the other 50%. He's not saying that maybe if you do all the right things, then God will be pleased with you. He's saying right now, because of what Jesus did upon the cross, you can have relationship with God. In fact, he says you can call him now Daddy, right? You can interact with him. You can have fellowship with him. You can ask him things in prayer and him listen and and, and engage with you because you've been made right with him. He doesn't stop there. Just in case you forgot the fact that he just said God lives inside of you, he wants to point to the greatest moment of God's power being displayed in history. He says, that same spirit that lives in you raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, Ephesians talks about it like this. Ephesians gives five separate Greek words for power because Paul wants to really explain that when Jesus went from dead to alive, when the resurrection happened, that was the ultimate display that humanity has ever seen or witnessed of God's power. Greater than the creation story is God raising Jesus Christ from the dead through his spirit. And Paul wants you to get the implic. Uh, we're, we're still losing. Uh, my grandfather says it like this. He says it's, it's like, you know, like going through the winter storm. They called up and they said, well, let's get the peaker plants running. Get the coal plants running. Get all the power. In fact, let's call up the nuclear plants. Uh, is there solar power? Can we do solar power in this part of Texas? Yeah, come on now. Right, eat. In essence, he's saying that all the power that ever existed, 
God used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. And Paul writes in Romans 8, that's inside you. And you're trying to tell me you can't overcome your cursing addiction. So now with that understanding, let's go to the therefore. Verse 12, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Now, I I need you to catch this. He said this, you have no obligation to sin anymore. So the devil can't make you do it. Like when I'm counseling somebody and they, they the, 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 the devil made me do it. I'm, I'm, one of two things is going on in my head. Either you, you ain't saved and the devil's still controlling your controller, right? Or you are saved and you just have a bad understanding. But if you catch this here, you don't have to sin if you don't want to. Now, the problem is you may want to. Now, that's a whole other thing I'd have to preach on. But you don't have to sin if you don't want to. Listen to me. If you're bound in addiction, if you're struggling with depression today, if you feel like there's no way you can overcome this sin in your life, I'm trying to tell you that the Bible says that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you with crazy amounts of power. And you don't have to sin if you don't want to. And so in this place, he says, now, the way you do it is you've got to die through the Spirit. The Spirit of God, not your self-effort, not your trying, the Spirit of God inside of you has to put to death the self-seeking behavior. And so as you spend time with Him, not as you try, as you spend time with Him, you're going to find that you grow into that image. All right, let me, uh, let me be practical. I'm a pastor. I just want to make sure that we all have a good understanding of what this really means. This means because you're right with God, you can talk to him. You can have fellowship. So it is important that you have that. So it looks like this. Maybe you wake up in the morning. You can do it at any point, but I like to do it in the morning. It starts your day well. You wake up in the morning, and I like to sing songs to God. Now, why is that? Because it honors him. It honors who he is. So some of you I can hear, but I can't sing. I'm not asking for people to be around. God would rather you sing even if you can't sing. In fact, I think God is more honored when you sing and you feel like you can't sing than if you had an Aretha Franklin voice and you were bursting it out with the wrong heart. Nothing wrong with Aretha. I like her, but I'm just giving you an, an example, right? So what's, what's beautiful, though, is that you sing to him, you worship him, you love on him. Do not sing songs as if he's not there. Too many churches are doing that. Don't do that if you come to this church. He's here. So you're like, well, what does that look like then? It's like when I call my wife, and I'm like, have I told you lately? That's how you sing to God. There we go. Come on. You talk to him like that. I was gonna do. I was gonna do the doors. Hello, I love. But I was like, no, nah, that's not safe. Uh, <laughs> so it took me a while to think of another song. But you you sing to God as if He's your lover, because He is. Then you open up that Bible, and you begin to read it. I love the Bible because it's the only book where the author's present when you read it. And you allow that word to speak to you. Don't expect an audible voice. A thought is faster. He'll drop thoughts into you. He'll begin to just just warm your heart. Don't go to him with a list yet. Don't go to him with your problems. Just just read the Bible and thank him for your life. Don't start the list yet. I'm trying to help you with God. You're like, but he wants to hear my list. Not yet. Right? And then as you're thanking him, as you're loving on him, then you can be like, God, i got to talk to you about my wife. And then he's going to say this. He's going to say, yeah, I saw that look you gave her. 
God, I didn't want to talk. I want to talk about, and he's like, maybe you should work on that. Look, what is he doing in that place? He's giving you power now to deny self. So that now when you're with your spouse and you're like, oh, I want to give you a look. And it's like, but there's that power within you because you fell in love with him and that love's powering you to overcome your self-seeking behavior. Because I... I'll just say this. If you go to the Lord and talk about your spouse and he begins to agree with you that she's jacked up, you're not hearing from the Lord. I'm just saying. Just saying. It may be Mother's Day, but I'm just saying. It's like I went to the Lord. I was like, Lord, she's cooking today. And he's like, no, she ain't. Right? Like, <laughs> Come on, praise God. All right. All right, catch this. So relationship, relationships helping you overcome sin. Not bootstrapping, not self-denial, not swear jar, not trying harder. Relationship. Relationship. You wake up, you spend a lot of time with God, you're going to find sin loses its grip. But I don't have time to spend time. Look, if you're, if you're a single mom and you're struggling... I've heard of moms locking themselves in the bathroom to get their time with God. Yeah, not even single moms, even just moms. Then they show up in the bathroom and you're just like, thank you, Lord. You know, I got you. All I'm trying to say is, if you want to overcome sin, it does not happen by your strength. It happens by the Spirit. That's further proof because you've got to be led by the Spirit of God. My last point, led. Fed, dead, and led. Wow, they rhyme, man. I'm feeling like Jay-Z up in here. Anyway, uh, that's not Jesus. Look, I'm so saved, I don't even know who Jay-Z is. All right, here we go. <laughs> so I can use them as a joke. All right, um, Galatians, I love this. Uh, Galatians is such a contrast between trying to do it of your own strength and allowing God to do it. And in Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 16th verse, he picks up and he says this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. See, now, I just hear you. See, pastor, I'm, I'm always, I'm just in this struggle. I'm just in this battle. There, there's no way I'm going to be finished. Well, you've got to keep reading, okay? Because he's going to say in verse 18, but when you are directed by the Spirit, y'all see that word, but? Y'all know what that word means? It's like when I look at Marlo and I say, honey, I love you, but? Doesn't matter what I said before, it's what I say after that matters, right? But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. What he's trying to contrast here is a life led by the law or a life led by the Spirit. And if you learn how to be led by the Spirit, what will happen is there will be a freedom in your heart that gives you the power to overcome. But if you live your life of, I got to do this and I got to do that, I got to try harder here, I got to put more self-effort here, one of two things will happen to you. Because the law mentality does this, either you're achieving personality... And you got your swear jar and that thing is completely empty. You've been six weeks good. You ain't said the F-bomb. You wanted to one time, but you didn't say it. So it didn't go in there. And so you're doing awesome, but you're doing it by your self-effort. So what happens in your heart, you're like, ah, I got it. Pride. And pride is revealed because you look at your brother who keeps cursing over stupid stuff. And you're like, dude, you just, you're not a Christian. You can't do it. Right? And you don't really realize it's only by the grace of God. So you go off in the wrong direction. And while you may not be sinning by cursing, you're sinning by self-effort. Or the flip side of following a law mentality is the, it will beat you up because your, your swear jar is so full. And you keep filling it up. And you're like, dang it, I'm just a, I'm a bad Christian. And you keep filling it up. And now you can buy everybody's Christmas gift with the swear jar, right? Like... Y'all, I'm the only one. Never mind. I'll just leave it alone. 
And so what happens? Guilt, condemnation, and shame rule over your life. And a life led by guilt, condemnation, and shame produce more guilt, condemnation, and shame. And you keep saying, I'm just never going to be able to do it. So then you start to live to that level of belief. But if you live a life led by the Spirit, sometimes it doesn't even look like you're going the right direction, but He sets you in the right path. See, because I need you to catch this about Satan. Satan's not necessarily hitting you in the moment. He's actually been working on you for years. See, because you think it's the cursing. But really what he's been going after is the identity. He's been hitting you with self-worth. He's been hitting you with, with you, you're a nobody. You ain't no good. He's been hitting you years before. He's been hitting your father before he even touched you, right? And so he's like the master chess player. He's setting things up to try to get you. And, and you keep thinking it's this one move that I got checkmated. It's, the, the, the reason I'm struggling with pornography is because I just I went to the computer. But you never realized it was way back here. You felt like you were never going to be loved by anybody because you were rejected by people. And so you just perpetuated that. And you think you got to fix an outward sin problem. And you're like, I'm always going to struggle with it. And see, the Holy Spirit wants to deal with the root that's going on in your heart. Mm, Y'all okay? I need you to catch this because this is how you're led by the Spirit. So what he'll do is he'll heal your heart before the issues even come up. Like King David. King David, when he goes into his, like, when he sees Bathsheba and then goes from sleeping with Bathsheba, she gets pregnant. Now he kills Uriah the Hittite, right? So he goes from adulterer to murderer and, like, lives in this sin until the prophet Nathan shows up. Like, like struggle. And we don't realize that the Bible sets us up before. It says when kings were supposed to be at war. See, if he had been led... In that moment, it would have never led to this moment. What is God trying to prepare you for now that he knows you'll face two weeks from now? But you're not even, like he's like, I'm going to get them ready for that moment. Like they'll be able to walk in forgiveness if I can get them to go through this. Uh, We see this with Joseph. Y'all know about Joseph's life? Joseph is sold into slavery, goes from slavery to Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife accuses him of rape and then he goes to prison like you look at that life and you're like man how is he being led by the spirit of God everything he touches seems to just fall apart and yet God uses all of those hardships so that when his brothers come to him in need he doesn't say forget you guys y'all wanted me dead I got power now I'm gonna make sure y'all are dead No, he had developed a character in Joseph to such a place that he said, y'all meant what y'all meant for evil, God meant for my good. Why am I telling you all that? Because sometimes you feel like you're led and you don't realize that he's training you for the future. Uh, Y'all ever seen Karate Kid? Not the one with Will Smith's son, the cooler one with Ralph Macchio, like... And what does Mr. Miyagi do? He makes him wax his cars, paint his fence, like, and and, and Ralph's like, what are you doing, man? Why Why am I having all to do all this? And then he starts throwing punches at him. Wax on, wax. Okay, bad example. Anyway, I grew up with Karate Kids, so one, two, and three. Um, See, Mr. Miyagi was doing some things to train him for what he knew he would need. And while it While it looked like it was meaningless, while God may be leading you and saying, hey, I want you to pay for these groceries here. I want you to love on this person here. And you're like, these things don't really matter. God says these things do matter because I'm taking you to a place to where when the enemy thinks he has you checkmated, I got a way of escape. That's good preaching. At least I'm going to listen to it later and amen myself. Uh, all by myself. Anyway, um, leave it alone. Leave it alone. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm rolling through with you guys. I was, I was supposed to preach another 40 minutes. So what happened? I was going to teach you all about patience today and just kind of keep the sermon rolling. 
But I did it to the 9 a.m. See, the 9 a.m., they always think they're getting out early, and I tricked them today. I took them late and then, then let them out. And uh, you guys, I'm going to let you out early so that the 9 a.m. starts getting jealous. So. <laughs> All right, let me close on this story. Uh, so I had grown up in church, and I had always been taught that I'm, you know, you're not perfect. You're going to have some sin that you struggle with. And so when I began to have sin that I struggle with, I just said, well, that's just my lot. And I believed that when I died, I'd finally be free from this sin. And so the problem is, because I believed that, that was my reality. And so I'd have this sin, and I'd struggle a little bit, but I'd confess it, kind of walk away for a couple of months, then come back. And then Satan checkmated me. See, because he just didn't deal with the sin issue, he began to deal with, are you sure you're called to pastor? And in 2015, when it didn't look like I was called to pastor and I had a bunch of struggles and trials and, and nobody wanted to show up. Thank God y'all showed up today, but nobody wanted to show up. And, and so I'm getting the pressure of maybe you're not called. In the midst of my pressure, now that sin that I was struggling with becomes more an addiction. And so it's so heavy now that, man, I can't even shake it. I'm confessing, but can't shake. I don't want you to know about it. And, and now I even got James's words on top of that. Don't many of you desire to become teachers because there's a greater judgment on those, right? So I'm like, what am I going to Like, I'm in the midst of just, like, turmoil on the inside. And I remember getting to the end of 2015, and I just said, man, I'm just going to seek the Lord. I didn't realize what I was doing is overcoming sin by just spending time with God. Not by trying to overcome sin, just spending time with them. But I said this, I said, if I can't do anything right, if I can't pastor, if I can't, I know I can just spend time with him. So I began to spend time with him. The same practical thing I told you. I get up, sing songs, read the Bible, talk to him, love on him, go about my day. I incorporated fasting with it, but it wasn't the fasting that brought about it. All fasting did was sharpen my spiritual senses to hear, Right? That's all it did, and I didn't even do it that well. I would, like, one day, 24 hours, I was like, praise God, I made it. All right. <laughs> but he was speaking. And as he began to speak to me, my heart began to get encouraged. And I heard some minister, his name was Dan Moeller, he came across a passage in Colossians. He says, hey, in this passage, it says that God sees you as holy, as blameless, and above reproach. In his sight. I don't care what mama sees about you. I don't even care what you see about yourself. If you said yes to Jesus, this is how God sees you. As holy, as blameless, and above reproach. I began to get up every day, look in the mirror, and say those words. It wasn't a work. It's not self If you think that's worth, go dig a ditch, right? You obviously have been in too much white-collar work your life, right? Go dig a ditch, and you'll find out what real work is. I just got up in the morning and talked to a mirror. Right? That's what, that's what uh, Saturday Night Live makes fun of. I did it. It works. It's funny the world would make fun of that to keep you away from it. As I did it, I'd look in the mirror. I'd say, Holy Spirit, you live on the inside of there, looking at my eye. I literally did this. What I found is the same sin that I thought I would always struggle with started losing its grip, losing its power on my life. To where I stand up here today, and it doesn't have the same hold. I'm not struggling with that sin anymore. Now, traffic, it's, I'm, still, I'm still growing. But, <laughs> but hear me, my friends. Relationship with God was the overcoming factor, not me dying one day and getting to heaven. And I'll hear people, they'll say, well, what are you saying now? You're perfect, pastor? And I'm just thinking, is your theology that bad? Because if my Bible in Galatians 2 says I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer me living, but Christ. And I, I don't, I, I think Christ is perfect. I'm not sure. Maybe I can check my, check the scriptures again. So every time somebody comes to me, and they stop coming because I keep saying this every time. I used to have people come after, you saying you're perfect, Pastor? You saying you don't sin? I was like, I'll just say this in the message and they'll stop coming. So you can hear my rebuttal before you even come. So if you tell me that line, what you're saying is perfection doesn't live inside you. But if I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, it's him living in me. 
And it's not my life I'm looking at anymore. It's his life in me. This life that I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. So what if I started doing that every day? Not, not trying, but just spending time with him. And he's like, uh, can you die here? And I'm like, okay, Jesus, right? Can you forgive that person here? Oh, okay, Jesus. Can you, can you cook for your wife today? I'm like, yes, Jesus, absolutely. It's Mother's Day. Some of you are like, we're going to go and cry, honey. All right. <laughs> we all bow our heads together today. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, I talked to you about a life that overcomes sin. But again, you can't be in that until you hand the controllers over to Jesus. I'm talking about more than just saying a prayer to get to heaven one day. I'm talking about eternal life that happens right now when you say yes to God. You tired of sin? Tired of living for yourself? Has life not worked out like you thought it should? I want to tell you that God has a, an amazing plan for your life. But it doesn't start until you say yes. You got to turn. You got to surrender. That's you today, and you know what you say? You know what? I, I need this Jesus. Or, or maybe you've said a prayer at some point, but if you were to examine your heart, you say, I'm not living right right now. I know for my own life, I'm the grandson of a pastor. I gave my heart to the Lord at a young age. But yet through a series of disappointments, Satan had me in checkmate. Stuck in sin. I was suicidal. I was ready to end it. And yet it was many prayers of my mama and invites from my father. And I went back to church and I said yes to God. And in that moment of rededication, I was never the same again. It wasn't about being perfect. It was about connecting to the one that was perfect. If that's you today, you want to say yes to God for a first time? Or you want to rededicate your life to God today? I want you to raise your hand high in the air. Today's the day he's for you, he's not against you. He loves you right where you're at. Yeah, I see those hands all over. Come on. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of new beginnings. Your simple yes connected with his power changes life. Father, you see all those hands lifted up towards you. God, we're trying... We're tired of trying to do it on our own. We need you. Forgive us of our sins. Wash us clean in your blood. We believe, Jesus, you died on the cross and rose again. And God, you're more than a God. You're now our Father. Teach us and guide us. Holy Spirit, fill us right now. Fill us with your power to overcome. In Jesus' name I pray. The people of God said, amen. Can we all make this confession of faith? Say, Jesus is Lord. I believe with that simple prayer and confession, you are brand new in the kingdom of God. It says, old things have passed away, all things are new. I want to encourage you with two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God.